thank you all for being here. Uh, as you might have suspected, this is the foreign policy panel. <laughs> and this is not going to be a seminar, uh, but rather think of it as a group of old duffers sitting, sitting at the bar telling war stories, drinking vodka or Jack Daniels or scotch, in Steve's case, gulping green tea. Um, so this is going to be for, pretty informal. We hope to address uh, three subjects, unless we just get completely off track. One is, the first is the how of Secretary. the Bush foreign policy. Oh, you're going to say something. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I could turn my head. <laughs> He comes back to College Station. You think he thinks he's president or something. He just starts, I don't know what the deal is. Hold on. You guys are raring to go. First of all, I'd ask you to please silence your mobile devices or turn them off uh, if you have not done so. Good morning and welcome. Yesterday, we took a look back at domestic policy. And this morning's session, we shift our focus to as our leader has told us, foreign policy. Uh, we believe President Bush's living legacy, however, is best represented through the mission of the George Bush School of Government and Public Service. The leader of the Bush School served for 37 years in the Foreign Service, during which he served as the United States Ambassador to Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Syria, Kuwait, and Lebanon. A recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Presidential Distinguished and Meritorious Service Awards, and many others, please join me in welcoming the Dean of the George Bush School of Government and Public Service, Ambassador Ryan Crocker. Ryan. Howdy. Howdy. Um, Secretary Gates just thought he was leading this panel. Uh, <laughs> um, um, thank you, Fred, for that. Uh, introduction and for the opportunity to uh, uh, be able to introduce this panel and to, uh, to greet all of you. I am Ryan Crocker, uh, Dean of the Bush School of Government and Public Service, um, uh, and I am delighted to have returned to my deanship uh, after uh, an assignment to uh, Afghanistan and then the, uh, uh, the Afghanistan of the American Northeast, uh, New Haven, Connecticut, uh, and <laughs> Uh, Yale University. I, um, I, uh, I actually uh, I, I spent some time teaching there before I came back here, and uh, I learned a lot. Uh, you know, uh, most important thing I learned is that there is a real need for institutions like Yale, uh, so that people who can't get into A and M have somewhere to go. So, <laughs> Um, Mr. President, Mrs. Bush, um, uh, I, I came to the Bush School in early 2010 because I believed in your vision, um, what you had inspired um, at this school, and I wanted to do my bit to help fulfill it. Um, it is a unique school. There is no other school quite like it in the nation. Um, we offer only a master's degree. We don't have undergraduates, and we don't have a PhD program. Uh, all of this to fulfill your vision um, of an institution that generation after generation will produce principled public servants who see public service as a noble calling. Um, uh, Mr. President, it is your living legacy. Um, we have over 300 resident students now. Um, that's up a third um, since I first walked in the doors in 2010. Um, their average GPA for the entering class, 3.6. I would not have gotten near this place. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, our graduates are in the Foreign Service, in the intelligence community, throughout state and local government, uh, as well as in other federal positions. Um, 
Uh, and every year there are more and more of them, and they are in uh, positions of greater seniority. Uh, uh, we're ranked in the top 12% uh, of graduate public affairs schools uh, in this nation, and we're going to be bringing them to single digits. Um, uh, we have an incredible faculty of both academics and practitioners, um, um, and we have worked our way up to a $75 million endowment. Not nearly enough, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, you will have seen some of our students here in the blue blazers at, say, Bush School. Um, there are Bush School ambassadors and the best of the best. Uh, hope you have a chance to uh, have a word with them. Uh, if you have any doubts about where America's future is heading, uh, you'll feel a lot better after that conversation. Um, uh, now, since you're really here, in spite of my best efforts, to hear from Secretary Gates and his colleagues, um, uh, I will just briefly introduce a group of people who obviously need no introduction. Uh, uh, during your administration, Mr. President, um, uh, Bob Gates served as Deputy National Security Advisor and then as Director of Central Intelligence. Uh, uh, he went on to be my predecessor as the first Dean of the Bush School and then President of this great university. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the 22nd Secretary of Defense of the United States, Robert Gates. Uh, to um, his right, metaphorically speaking, um, <laughs> uh, is uh, Dr. Richard Haas. Um, uh, from 1989 to 1993, he served as special assistant uh, to President Bush and Senior Director for New East and South Asian Affairs at the National Security Council. Uh, uh, he went on to be Director of Policy Planning at the State Department uh, and is now the President of the Council on Foreign Relations. Dr. Richard Haas. Uh, Richard Kerr, Dick Kerr, uh, is a 32-year veteran of the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, we could tell stories. Uh, 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 and he served as deputy director um, during the administration of President Bush, 1991-1992. Welcome. From 1989 to 1993, uh, the totality of uh, uh, the President's administration, Steve Hadley uh, served as the um, Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy. Um, uh, he went on to uh, serve as Deputy National Security Advisor uh, and then National Security Advisor where I had the privilege of working with him during my time in Iraq. Uh, he is now the board chairman of the United States Institute of Peace, Mr. Steve Hadley. Uh, and it is my intense pleasure and relief uh, to uh, introduce Ambassador Robert Kimmett, uh, who was lost in space somewhere between Houston and here, and arrived at 959. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, he was um, Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs um, and our Ambassador uh, to Germany. Um, uh, uh, welcome, Ambassador Kimmett. Mm -hmm. 
What you may note about this panel is that having served President Bush with distinction, uh, they all went on to do other great things. Uh, one of the President's many enormous qualities is his ability to pick people. Uh, uh, arguably the best uh, and most knowledge, knowledgeable and experienced president we ever had, uh, uh, that additional gift of getting the right people in the right places at the right time uh, uh, is something that has been almost without parallel. And they've all gone on uh, to do other great things. Um, I would be the exception to that. Um, <laughs> uh, I was the president's um, ambassador to Lebanon uh, beginning in 1990 uh, when the uh, Civil War was uh, still going on. The only quality I brought to the, um, the field and led to Secretary Baker and the president uh, deciding I should go to Lebanon was my inherent expendability. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I remained expendable through uh, Syria, Iraq, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. It's, uh, it's, uh, 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 Mr. Secretary, gentlemen, the floor is finally yours. <laughs> well, as I was saying when <clears throat> Fred so rudely interrupted me <laughs> with the planned program, uh, we hope to cover uh, three subjects. First, the how of Bush foreign policy, national security policy, not only what was achieved, but the process by which it was achieved and why people subsequently have looked back on it as a model uh, of uh, how, the, how it should work. The second is uh, the end of the Cold War, and the third is the Gulf War. All of these probably will only take us until about two or three o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> so we will try and uh, move it right along, but as I said, we hope that this will be a casual conversation with, uh, with people uh, interrupting uh, each other and so on, which we've set a good precedent for. <laughs> so, so Steve, you and I first joined the NSC during the Nixon administration. We've served in a number of other uh, administrations. Why don't you say a word about uh, why uh, the Bush period was different. Bob, I, Bob arrived, I think, <clears throat> in spring of 74. I arrived in July of 74, a month before President Nixon res uh, resigned. We, we joined the crew of the <clears throat> Titanic after it hit the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I was pretty far down. Bob was up here. I was pretty far down in the organization at the National Security Council. Uh, but there was a sense uh, that something was not right in the White House. I could feel it. Um, for all his brilliance in foreign policy, uh, President Nixon, by the end of his administration, after Watergate and a variety of other things, the tone coming down from the, from the top was something that you could feel even down at my level. And there was some uh, unease. There was anxiety, there was some lack of confidence in the integrity and leadership of the administration. And I say that, you know, I, I don't want to be unfair to President Nixon, uh, and, and I admit to have had a very worm's eye view, but I say it because of the contrast of the tone that came down from the top in President Bush's administration. And you could feel it even if you were no longer in the White House, but you were out in the agencies, in my case, at the, the Department of Defense. It was absolutely clear this was a tone of integrity, of doing what is right for the country uh, above all, and also a tone of uh, inclusiveness, respectfulness, and courtesy that extended even to mid-level folks out in the agencies. And for me, it was brought home uh, in the one time that I came to uh, Camp David to brief the president uh, on a subject. Uh, and I uh, went to the men's room. And I find myself, to my great surprise, standing at a urinal next to the one being used by the 41st president of the United States. <laughs> And I, of course, was mortified and was looking 
for a toilet that I could flush myself down. <laughs> but uh, the president, sensing my unease, made a little small talk and put me right at ease. And for me, that was President Bush. Courteous, um, respectful, whether it was in the men's room or in the conference room. And all of us have served in a lot of organizations for the subsequent 25 years. And we've all seen how important tone at the top is to an organization. And nobody set a better tone than President George H.W. Bush. Steve, why don't you and Bob talk a little bit about, you guys were, Bob was at state, uh, Steve, you were at defense. Talk a little bit about your perspective of, of the interagency and, and the process at, at that time. And, you know, for example, how Secretary Baker came to embrace the deputies committee and, and also how the president's tone at the top was reflected in the way that his most senior officials treated each other, uh, even outside the White House. Well, I actually had joined the NSC staff in June of 76, so I guess I came in on one of the rescue boats picking up people who were <laughs> left in the lifeboats. Um, I was considerably junior to Steve Hadley, so it sort of tells you where I was yeah. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in, the, in the pecking order. But I think one of the striking things about President Bush's administration was that so many of the senior people had served together in that Ford administration in different capacities. President Bush, Jim Baker, Brent Scowcroft, Dick Cheney. So they had actually known each other going back to that period. So by the time they came into the administration together in new positions, elevated positions in 1989, um, they already knew and trusted each other. And if you think about it, all five of us had sort of grown up together in the Ford and Reagan years. We had long since figured out whether we liked each other or not. We knew how to get in the room and, and get things done. I think that was really important with how quickly things came at us, particularly in 1989 and 90. Um, a story that captures it for me is um, the uh, senior most um, foreign service officer at the State Department was um, Larry Eagleburger as Deputy Secretary, although the Foreign Service wasn't really quite sure that he was still a Foreign Service officer since he had been gone for four years. The next most senior was a fellow named Reg Bartholomew, um, who many of us had worked with, who was in charge of arms control. Uh, Reg was a thespian from Dartmouth. Um, that continued to play through uh, in his uh, performance uh, in the interagency process. Uh, a tremendously effective person, but probably of the senior people at state, the one who sort of knew the secretary the least. And I remember we were preparing for the NATO ministerial in the spring of 1989. And Reg came back one morning to senior staff and said to the secretary, Mr. Secretary, we were over at defense yesterday and on that issue that you told us to raise, we just beat them into submission and we got everything we wanted. And uh, Secretary Baker said, Reg, uh, uh, good work. I know you did what was right for the country because Dick Cheney is a friend of mine. I think he has the toughest job in government and I certainly wouldn't want to do anything to make his task any more difficult. <laughs> you could have almost heard a pin drop in the, in the room. You would not have heard that in several previous administrations where we served, where the duel between either the NSC or subsequent and ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> where, where the duels between and among NSC, state, and defense were legion. I think, going to Steve's good point, the tone at the top from the president and that team of people who had known and trusted each other years before, and those of us who had grown up bureaucratically, I think got us off to the start that we did. I think there were some structural things that actually facilitated what Bob talked about. Um, one was, uh, quite frankly, Brent Scowcroft, who 
has set the model for what a national security advisor should be. <clears throat> An honest broker, uh, treating his national security peers with respect and inclusiveness, um, always serving the president, um, his ego well in hand, uh, and also operating behind the scenes and off stage. Uh, it uh, is a standard all of us uh, who followed in that office tried to, to, to follow, and I think it's a model none of us fully lived up to. So I think that was crucial for promoting the kind of collegiality we talked about. Secondly, it was an innovation in the Bush administration. It may have been tried before, but I think it really became of age, which was the deputies committee, which Bob Gates led so well and which really came of age in the preparations for the Gulf War, which Richard really was, um, was um, critical in. And all of these gentlemen here uh, participated in the deputies process and it became the workhorse of the interagency in every subsequent administration. Um, and then the third thing I think that was done was an innovation from Secretary Baker who, uh, if you're Secretary of State, the, the, uh, the bane of your existence is the interagency process. Because you get a good idea, you go to the President of the United States, you say, Mr. President, I want to go to the Russians on arms control and make this proposal, and then he's got to deal with the troglodytes of the interagency process, who sort of nick, nibbling away at his, uh, at, his, at his initiative. And some are in the intelligence community, some in the Treasury Department, but most especially they are in the Department of Defense. And I was one of those troglodytes with which Secretary Baker had to deal. Uh, and he, of course, had a very innovative suggestion. He, he put all of us, the interagency folks, on an airplane with him the ungroup it was called, ably chaired by the late Arnie Canner. And he took us wherever he went to meet with the Russians to talk about arms control or anything else. And when he wanted to have initiative, he would bring us all together and he'd say, hey, look, here's the initiative I want to do. And he would make his case, and nobody is more persuasive in making a case than James A. Baker III. And then he would say, so that's what I'm going to do. Are you all on board? And you then had a Hobson's choice. You could say yes, in which case, he had you because you had to then say, uh, sell your principal, in my case, Secretary Cheney. Or you could say no, in which case he would say, well, get Cheney on the phone. And of course, it was three in the morning back in Washington <laughs> most of the time. Um, but the result of that was he was free from some cabinet secretary after the fact uh, trying to undercut his initiative. It was uh, a very uh, smart move on his part. But it's, again, institutional things that were done, I think, to institutionalize and promote the collegiality and inclusiveness that President Bush wanted and that he directed from the top. Dick, as a professional lifetime intelligence officer, you saw this process uh, uh, up close. Uh, your thoughts on the deputies? Well, it was, uh, intelligence officers are always a bit insecure. Um, they, they provide information to people and sometimes they never hear a word. They don't know whether how it was accepted. They don't know whether it was right or wrong necessarily. And they just throw it out there and hope that someone is interested. Um, sometimes that can make you very insecure. You wonder what, whether you're doing the right thing or not. The deputies committee provided a, a unique forum to that was very structured in the sense that beginning every deputies meeting, I gave a presentation on intelligence at Bob's request. I had five, seven minutes, maybe. So I had to get the intelligence community, and I tried to bring in all of the intelligence agency. This was before there, by the way, there was a DNI, thank God. But <laughs> nevertheless. <laughs> I, I would gather, I would call usually the heads of the various organizations, I would gather the intelligence senior principals on a particular subject together, and, and we would work out through conversation more than writing, kind of the key issues, the key points we wanted, that I wanted to make in a very brief short time. Bob was very, ran a, a meeting that usually did not last much more than one hour. And if you went very long, you were hauled up short. And so it was crisp, 
clear, and hopefully relevant. I had wonderful, I had the, uh, the distinct advantage that I got immediate feedback. I was involved, but not a, not a, a cheerleader for the policy, but I was involved with it. But it's separate enough that I could provide independent comment and judgments on the intelligence without, without fear of being kind of intimidated by this group, which was rather impressive after all. Uh, sitting around wanting to harass you. And they all had their own intelligence sources, too. So it, it, was a, it was an interesting gathering. There's no question. I'll say one personal note. I was, a, I was a, as Secretary of uh, State said last night, uh, I was a, a part of the Bush tribe early on because uh, George Bush had been the director of CIA, and I knew him a bit. I was junior officer, but I had a few occasions. And then I became... Uh, when he was vice president, a briefer of the PD President's Daily Brief and briefer for nearly two years. So I had a, a daily uh, chance to see him. And so I was, a I was part of the Bush tribe fairly early on. And as I understood his appreciation for intelligence and, 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 his, and his knowledge about it, because he was also a good critic. Uh, the thing about the deputies that was most valuable was we were able to get an understanding of what was needed by the policymaker. We were able to respond to that. I was able to go back to Bill Webster, the director, and talk to him about tasking. We, we had no intermediaries between what was asked for and, and how we could deliver on what we promised at that deputies meeting, which was unique, I think, in most administrations. My guess is that most of the people around the committee cannot deliver even their own their own departments or agencies. We could, and with Bill Webster involved in this process, we could, we could make it work. If and, you uh, commented once about, to me about how the collegiality of the deputies committee helped in problem solving among agencies outside of the White House. Absolutely, and I used to go, intelligence officers always get there first at a meeting, unlike Bob Kimmett. <laughs> um, <laughs> who arrived a second before. I would arrive 15 or 20 minutes before to try to get business done with Dave Jeremiah, Admiral Jeremiah, who was the representative of the Joint Chiefs. And if we had a problem with defense, I would talk to Dave at the meeting. I would talk to Bob Kimmett at, at the meeting or after the meeting saying, we've got something at state that we were worried about. And your agencies and departments always have conflict across the line. So the ability to deal with that with an individual that you trusted. And I might say one more thing about the ability. We could provide sensitive intelligence at that meeting without fear that it was going to be compromised. To my knowledge, in the four years, I, three and a half years I was involved, we never had a major leak of intelligence, out, <coughs> certainly out of the deputies committee. And we were confident that someone wasn't going to go home, go, go back to their organization and complain about what you did or what you didn't do. We didn't have that kind of acrimonious kind of backbiting that occurs so often in bureaucracies. It just didn't happen. One of the things that I think helped the deputies committee was both the continuity at the top in terms of the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, National Security Advisor, through all the momentous events of uh, 1989, 90, and 91, but also the continuity at the deputies level. The core group, through all the momentous events of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the liberation of Eastern Europe, the Gulf War, reunification of Germany, was really the same five people. I chaired it. Bob Kemet represented state. Dick represented CIA the whole time. Uh, Dave Jeremiah, Admiral Dave Jeremiah, represented uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff for almost all of that period. And uh, believe me, he would be here had he not recently passed away and uh, very much lamented. And then defense was represented by Paul Wolfowitz. It was the same crew for that entire two and a half or three year period. And that continuity at both the top and at the next level, I think, also made a huge difference. Richard? Well, thanks, Bob. While I'm, while I'm thanking Bob, I, I know I speak for everyone here, and I thank him for not writing a memoir about this administration. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> you would have featured prominently. Yeah, I know. That's why I thank you. Uh, I think this administration worked well uh, for two reasons, and it's really what makes history happen. It, it's ideas and people. And there was something of a, a common understanding about the purpose of American foreign policy that permeated the administration, both at the top level, the president, uh, Secretary Baker, Brent Scowcroft, and others, and at our level. And I think there was an emphasis that essentially the principal focus or business of American foreign policy ought to be on shaping the foreign policies of others. And we saw it with the end of the Cold War. We saw it with Tiananmen Square, which is coming up on its 25th anniversary in US-China relations. We saw it in the aftermath of the Gulf War. There was a sense of purpose, but also limits. And I, and I believe that intellectual consensus, which uh, distinguished this administration to varying degrees, both from those which came before and those which came after, put it in a very good stead. It wasn't an exclusive emphasis on foreign policy, but it was a, a focus. And I, and I believe that that, that realism uh, served it well. The other, as people here have emphasized, is people, both at the top level and the, uh, the bottom level. Um, Brent has rightly been, been, been singled out. Uh, you know, for, for most of us sitting here today, this is a chance to go down, down memory lane. But for Brent, this is something special and different. For those of you who didn't work with us, Brent was often known as the person uh, who every now and then would, would fall asleep during meetings and we, something was created called the Scowcroft Award to honor those who would do it. And so for, while for us, for us, again, this is a chance, a little bit of a history, for Brent, this is something else today. It's news. Uh, <laughs> and, and I just want to say one, I just want to correct one other impression here. Because you would think from listening to my colleagues, uh, and as you can see, there was tremendous talent in this administration. And uh, the president, uh, as has been said, you know, as I think Ryan said, it really was great at correct, selecting people of talent and, and creating uh, a tone. But it wasn't all sweetness and light. The idea that an interagency you know, meeting you know, process always worked out and we were all friends up to a point, and I'll just give one personal experience just to show you the, the limits. It was 1992, and it was judged that it was finally safe for a senior American official to travel to, to Lebanon. So we gathered in Syria, and then Secretary Baker was the senior American official who was asked to go into Lebanon. This is the first time in more than a decade because of the hostages and so forth. Tremendous security and all that. And I was traveling with the uh, secretary, even though, as he will admit, we didn't always have the closest relationship. I was the guy at the White House who he used to complain about uh, to Brent. So the night before, uh, we got our motorcade assignments and all that, whenever you travel with the secretary. And I said, wow, finally, Secretary Baker wants the benefit of my counsel. And we're going we're gonna to travel together tomorrow as we go into Lebanon. I, you know, I was really excited, and I kind of prepared my talking points really carefully. So at 5 o'clock in the morning or whatever it was, I got up. I got into the car dutifully a few minutes early. And I waited and I waited. And I nervously checked my watch. Secret Service gets in the car. Finally, we take off. And only then it hit me. I was the decoy. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah. Just take all this interagency friendship with a grain of salt. Actually, actually, it was Brent that volunteered you. <laughs> Bob, Bob, can I just uh, yeah. say one thing? I think Richard just brought up a point. Um, <laughs> bureaucratic friction is not always a bad thing. It can be creative and productive, or it can be personal and destructive. I think what we were able to avoid was the personalization of policy differences. If everybody comes in agreeing about everything, first of all, why are you even having the meeting? What we needed to do was to bring our best thoughts and put it together in a way that then teed it up for the president and others to make their decisions. I uh, agree 100% with what Steve said uh, about Brent's role. Um, I would say, Bob, your role in the Deputies Committee is exactly. why the Deputies Committee right. still exists today. You ran the Deputies Committee as fairly as Brent ran the NSC system, and you provided that continuity and, and connectivity between what we did and the principles. And it didn't flow just one direction. 
um, and we'd have our meetings, you would take our views forward, but then we always had that feedback from you that we needed to make sure that good instructions were sent out to the field, whether it be to the military commands or to embassies. And having been in an embassy later, you know, where you spend half the time trying to decipher what this really means, if we don't get it right before it leaves Washington, it's going to be nothing but confusing uh, in the field. Every NSC from 1947 to 1989, as presidencies changed, a totally new system was set up. New committee system, they named the committees different things, they named their study memorandums, their decision memorandums different things. Since 1989, the system has not changed. All of us have been in it. Maybe how it operates has changed, but the fundamental structure that was set up uh, has survived both intra and inter-party changes. I think that's a great credit to you and Brent, not only for what you set up, but how you executed it. Well, the thing that, <clears throat> there, there are two things that I would say. First, <clears throat> there were a lot of disagreements, and, and my objective in those meetings uh, was to try and strip away all of the bureaucratic BS and try and define for the president and the principals what are the real disagreements here? What, what are the core disagreements so that he had a decision that he could make on what was really at stake and not something that was kind of fuzzed up by a lot of bureaucratic uh, turf issues and things like that. And the great thing about the deputies was that the, the thing that Brent and I had insisted on in, in establishing it was we wanted people who had immediate access to their principal. So when we would have a meeting, the meeting would end with an action recommendation and I would say, here's what I'm going to take to Brent and the president, and if your principal has a disagreement with it, then get back to me by 5 o'clock this afternoon, or same day. And, and, uh, and, if there were, and if there were disagreements, then I would say, so here are the different positions that I'm going to take to the president so that he knows exactly what we're doing. Now, every now and then, we'd have a big debate about what the president wanted. And one of my favorite memories was that we were having this acrimonious debate about what the president wanted, and I said, well, the hell with it, I'll just go ask him. So I walked out of the deputies' meeting, walked up to the Oval Office, went in and said, here's the issue, what do you think? He told me, I went back down and said, here's what the president really thinks. Believe me, when it came to the credibility of the deputies' committee, that helped a lot <laughs> <laughs> to, have, to have the president give me that kind of access and, and to be able to do that sort of thing. The other thing, that anybody who's been in senior positions in government, I think, would agree with. It, and I don't know whether American people would be reassured or uh, scared to learn this, of how much laughter there is in the Situation Room. And it's mainly, I think, the way sane people deal with incredibly difficult issues, often issues of, of life and death. But the Deputies Committee process became so good that when we started the, when the Gulf War, when we were preparing for the Gulf War and we had to spread uh, to other agencies, we were getting requests, including from the post office department, wanting to bring an issue to the deputies committee because that was the only place they figured they'd ever get a decision out of the government. But um, anybody else on, on process? I would, just, I would just conclude with this thought. One of the other reasons that policy was so good and so much was accomplished in the Bush administration was that the principals reached out and recruited enormously talented young people to work for them directly. In State's case, it was Bob, uh, Secretary Baker hiring Bob, hiring uh, Bob Zellick, uh, Dennis Ross, and others. It was Brent hiring, recruiting Condi Rice and uh, Bob Blackwell and Richard uh, and, and the defense, people like Steve. And, and what's more, the principals, having recruited these quality people, fostered their ability to come up with new ideas and converted those amazing ideas into really significant policy. And I think probably um, that was seen most uh, effectively on the reunification of Germany. But uh, did you have one other thing that you want to say, Richard? Okay, okay move on. Let's, let's move on uh, to the Cold War. Uh, and <clears throat> when we arrived uh, 
in the White House in January of 1989. I had just come from being Deputy Director of Central Intelligence. Dick took my place. But the thing that made a big impact on me right out of the gate was how much information was coming from the intelligence community, from CIA, about how much trouble the Soviet Union was in, that it was truly in a crisis. And it kind of set the stage for a lot of things that we were going to do. So Dick, you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, we had some extraordinarily good analysts uh, on the Russian-Soviet problem. Uh, Bob Blackwell, not well, Bob Blackwell, uh, Fritz Ehrmarth, uh, George Colt, Gray Hodnett, a, a variety of people with great experience and, and uh, who had a, a keen sense of what the history was, had followed uh, the Russian problem, the Soviet problem for years and, and understood the nuances of the Communist Party and the leadership. And it was early on that they began, and particularly I think their, uh, Gray Hodnett probably was one of the, the most perceptive about looking at change ahead, fundamentally saying, Gorbachev can't make this work. It just will not work. He's got, he's got some things that he's trying to do that are fundamentally opposing each other, trying to hold the party together, trying to hold the, the republics together, trying to fundamentally change the, the uh, the nature of the country trying to have an economic advance. Things, objectives that were mutually, uh, uh, really could not, could not work. And I think we understood that. The Communist Party uh, meeting in 89, I guess, was a good example where he could not deliver things. And I think the agency uh, did a very good job in terms of providing the policymakers a set of on flowing, ongoing documents that describe the situation and how fundamentally Russia was falling apart and Gorbachev was losing control. And, and uh, it was, it, it went, that went on, I don't know whether you want to talk about the coup uh, at this point. Yeah, but, in a minute. Uh, but it, it went on, uh, I think, with a steady flow of information. And I think and that's, a, that's a period when we really, if you went back and looked at the history of that, uh, of the intelligence reporting, it would be one with a lot of high marks. Um, the one thing I was going to say beyond the, the Russian, the Soviet problem, you have to kind of put this in the context of what was going on elsewhere in the world. This was a very unstable world uh, at that point in time. A lot of things were happening. South Africa, the Middle East was having riots in Gaza and, and uh, the uh, West Bank. There were problems of uh, Yugoslavia was in the process of b breaking up. I mean, the world was, this was not just a single problem which everybody could focus on at one, and, and pay attention to. This was a complex set of problems, all coming nearly, not quite at the same time, but really nearly simultaneously as you went through this. It was not one single problem at a time. We'll solve that problem and move on to the other neatly. It well, didn't I'll, work I'll just, that way. I'll just underscore that. Uh, we were planning for the president's visit to Eastern Europe, and I was in Kenny Bunkport with him uh, at the beginning of June, and everybody remembers uh, Tiananmen Square. But what nobody remembers is that that same weekend, Ayatollah Khomeini died, and something that, because of those first two events, nobody remembers, a Soviet train carrying 1,500 children was going through a mountain pass and a parallel gas pipeline blew up, killing all of those children. And so we were watching what was going on there with this terrible humanitarian tragedy, but we had Tiananmen Square, we had the, the situation in Iran and so on. So I mean, Dick's point is a good one and it's, and it's always true. There are always uh, problems. I remember telling, when I came back to government in 2006, I remember telling President Bush 43 and Condi Rice, I say, you know, when I was in government before, crises would come up, be dealt with, and go away. Nothing ever goes away anymore. It's all there kind of bubbling along. Uh, but uh, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let's, let me talk uh, uh, for a second about Eastern Europe and, and then have everybody chime in. I want to read um, something that... Uh, 
that I wrote uh, 15 years ago about the president's uh, visit to Eastern Europe to, uh, in the summer of 1989. From July 9 to 13, Bush visited Poland and Hungary. For his East European audience, the message was one of support and encouragement for the reform process. What many critics saw as Bush's excessive sympathy for the old guard on the trip was an attempt to grease their path out of power by showing respect and pretending, at least where he could with a straight face, that they were playing a constructive role in the unfolding of their nation's history. If violence were avoid avoided, we knew reform would inexorably proceed. Bush's friendly, solicitous approach to the soon-to-be ousted leaders, for example in Poland, was intended to smooth transition and to avoid providing them or their regimes any pretext for a dying orgasm of bloodletting. And so he ensured that both Jaroszelski and Valenza were at the luncheon he hosted at the U.S. Embassy residence in Warsaw and had pictures taken of the three of them, just one big happy family. Bush's second audience was the Soviets, just as he tried to help ease the passage from power of old leaders in Eastern Europe by treating them respectfully and by seeming to make them part of the process of change, so too did he give the impression that countries easing out of the Soviet orbit were doing so with Moscow's help and that this was to the Kremlin's self-perceived advantage. At the time, not knowing what was to come in the months ahead in Eastern Europe, journalists and other observers saw little remarkable in the Bush trip. Only in retrospect could people see that an American president traveled to Eastern Europe in mid-July 1989 with an unvarnished message of support for political freedom and national independence. He departed a few days later having boosted reform and blunted the fears of those most threatened. Only later would anyone, including those of us involved, see that it had been a remarkable high-wire balancing act in which a misplaced step could have been catastrophic. Comment? I would say those words could be written with almost equal force in terms of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Mm. I'm sorry things dissolved in Yugoslavia the way that they did, but if you had to have it happen in either Yugoslavia or the former Soviet Union. From a strategic perspective, I think the way it was managed coming out of uh, uh, the fall of Gorbachev, the rise of Yeltsin, played to some of those same characteristics that, that you just described. It actually brings up one point, and that is um, a lot of times when people think of the Deputies Committee, they think of it in how it reacted to the Gulf War uh, the fall of the wall and so forth, but actually at the start of the administration, we took a three to six month period and did a whole set of policy reviews. Um, some people thought that might not have been needed since this was the first intra-party transfer of power in quite some time, but Brent uh, at the President's direction said, no, we need to look at this, and one of the things we looked at was Eastern Europe because a lot was happening. The barbed wire was being cut between Austria and Hungary, the developments in, in uh, uh, Warsaw and elsewhere. But I remember we were really struggling with exactly what should we do, what can we do, and I remember vividly the National Security Council meeting when we presented the results of our study. Um, you, through Brent and Dick, had given a bit of an uh, intelligence overview. and We had a large discussion, but there was a general sense that, all right, what is it we should be doing? And I remember the president at one point turned around and looked to all of us sitting behind him and said, well, look, you're the guys who did this work. You're the smart guys. What should we be doing? Of course, scared the heck out of us, right? <laughs> we, we thought we had sort of prepared our principles well for this, but it was a period of time um, that um, Gorbachev was actually playing some of his cards relatively well, particularly on the arms control front in terms of troop reductions and, and withdrawals that he was announcing. He was playing right to the Germans because we were having a debate with the Germans about something called follow-on to Lance. Lance was a very short-range nuclear missile that if fired from our bases in West Germany could only go as far as East Germany. And of course the Soviets at that time had almost a half million soldiers there. It made good tactical sense, but from a strategic political perspective it put Kohl and Genscher in a very bad situation. So I think sometimes we think there was sort of an inevitability of what happened. 
in fact, holding things together and trying to figure out exactly what approach we should take, I thought was pretty challenging during that period. And then I think the tone was set both in what you read, Bob, that is the trip to Eastern Europe, and then the trip earlier where the president in Mainz called for Germany and the United States to be partners in leadership. And that, I think, gave a boost to what we needed to do with Germany uh, in those years that followed. Then? I, just following up on what Bob said, I, I have been struck after over the last 10 years or so to talk to people and to do some talks about uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union and, and uh, the Eastern Europe. And the thing that I've been fascinated by is people generally say, ah, well, this was all inevitable. It was just going to go like this. It was just a logical path. And there was nothing, there was nothing dramatic about what we did. It was just the course of history. And if we let it all go, and that is just so much baloney. <laughs> I mean, it, there is just no question that at every moment along the way, the fine hand and touch of the people there and here and, and some of the people uh, at this table, the ability to play the thing and to do it right, to not push too hard, to let something settle before you did something. It was brilliant. And in some ways, it was so brilliant that you didn't know it was happening. Well, it, I mean, I've, I've said that there is no, I know of no precedent in history for the collapse of a major empire without a major war. And that someday, this president would get the credit that he deserves for having managed that process. Richard? Just a couple of points, one building on Dick. Uh, success tends to look inevitable in retrospect, and failure doesn't. And it's interesting, when things go wrong, people always are searching for what did the government do wrong, rather than looking at larger historical forces. And when things go right, you're exact, you, you are exactly right. People tend to underestimate uh, you, the human agency. Again, there's, there's very little that, that was inevitable. And I think it's worth looking at some of the things that were done. One was uh, what this president and I thought was particularly good at was investing in, in relationships before the crisis happened. It's also, and, 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 you know, I run an institution, one of the things you've got to do is raise money. You never make your first conversation with somebody the ask. And, I, and in diplomacy, it's the same thing. You, you invest in these relationships. In some ways, consultations become more important than negotiations, because what you've done is you've shaped, you've shaped a relationship. And I think that was one of the hallmarks President's diplomacy. People used to make fun of him at time for dial diplomacy. But then when the crisis did happen, that investment suddenly yielded uh, enormous returns. The other was, and it, it's, again, it's not often practiced, it's a willingness not to try to get 100%, 100% of the time. You, you, you need to, in some ways, give the, the person on the other side of the table who's dealing with a raft of domestic and other challenges, you've got to give them a little bit of space. And you've got to, if you press your advantage to the maximum at every step of the way, say against the Gorbachev, who was, who was dealing with all sorts of pressures, any short-term game could have come at the cost of enormous long-term losses. And again, uh, I thought it showed a certain maturity and even a willingness at times to be criticized. Well, why aren't you maximizing what it is you could do? And the president was criticized at times you know, for not celebrating uh, the coming down of the wall and, and so forth. But I, I actually thought that discipline uh, yielded enormous uh, results and, and dividends for the United States uh, as, as history unfolded. I think, first of all, the telephone diplomacy, when it, when it first started, was actually kind of funny because <clears throat> when the president started calling some of these leaders, the response on the other end was, who? <laughs> what? And, you know, it was like, yeah, and I'm Queen Elizabeth kind of thing. <laughs> and the operators at the White House, as good as they are, was having to break through all of these barriers to get to these people that the president wanted to talk to. The other thing was, you know, there's been a lot about NSA in the, in the news in the last few months. We would sit there as the president was getting ready to make a call, and I'd say, now, don't forget, Mr. President, you're on a party line. <laughs> There's at least six other countries listening in on your conversation, <laughs> so be careful what you say. And, uh, but, you know, I mean, to, to uh, Richard's point about, about not pushing it, I think one of the keys was one of the most significant things in 1989 and 1990 
was avoiding any kind of a provocation that could have given the hardliners in, particularly in Moscow, but in some of the East European capitals, the justification for sending the troops uh, into, the, into the field. And, and I'll tell a story on myself on this one. So I had been saying for quite some time that I was pretty convinced, apropos of what Dick was saying, that Gorbachev ultimately was going to fail in his effort to reform the Soviet Union. And, and I was going to give a speech at Georgetown to this effect. And uh, I cleared it with the lower levels at state. But Secretary Baker called Brent and said, Gates can't give this speech. It, it's just going to screw everything up because it'll sound like the administration's speaking with two voices. You know, I'm out there trying, we're trying to get as much benefit, as much mileage out of Gorbachev as we possibly can, and to have somebody else in the administration go out there and say he's going to fail is not helpful to that effort. Well, I was really ticked, and I, I pouted for a day or two, thought about resigning, and to make a longer story short, I ended up writing a note to Secretary Baker and telling him that he'd been right and I'd been wrong. And it would have been a mistake to give that speech. But it, it goes back to these personal relationships uh, inside an administration. Sometimes, though, you've got to make clear that you have to be clear uh, in making the point you want to make. And one story I would tell uh, had to do with the, the attempted military coup against Gorbachev, which I think occurred in August, and of course, all the bad things seems to come in August. And Let me set the predicate for this, if yes, we're sir. going to move to the coup. So August 18th, I think, I'm in Kenny Bunkport again with the president, and, and, there, and I'm, I'm, this was the best possible way to present the president with the president's morning briefing, sitting on the deck in Kenny Bunkport eating pancakes. <laughs> And he's reading through, and there is a pretty stark warning in the PDB from CIA that there's going to be a coup attempt against Gorbachev because this new treaty was going to be signed or go into effect on August the 20th. And that, that would have led to beginning to break apart the Soviet Union. And the <clears throat> president reads it, and he said, should I take this seriously? And I said, yes, sir, I believe you should. Uh, so go ahead. So uh, there, is, there is a desire uh, to put together uh, a press release that would make clear that I'm we, sorry. Let me interrupt you again. Yeah. <laughs> Say, okay, Fred. This Bob is the way it works. <laughs> well, he actually the deputy shared the deputy I, 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 I just about want to, to try and get. So. I, I just want to get the sequencing right. So we have a deputies <laughs> committee on the 19th or the 20th. I can't remember what the date. And we're back in Washington. And, and Dick, you come in and report that CIA thinks the coup will fail. You want to say a word or two about that? Well, we had a good, we had very good coverage of the Soviet, the military district in the Moscow area. And we had follow, cr followed crises before. And we kind of knew what would happen. We knew that the airborne units would be put on alert. Some of the KGB special units would be put on alert. We knew that there'd be the railroad, the railroads would be blocked, that, that radio stations would be controlled. We knew a lot of things about what had happened in previous crises. None of those were happening. It was quiet. We even talked to our, to our station chief in Moscow. He said, the streets, people are driving the streets. This doesn't. And so we came, essentially said, this is a, and I, the, I remember the very words I told the president. And, Secretary Cheney and, and uh, Brent Scowcroft and, and Bill Webster as well saying they ran this flag up the flagpole, the coup flag up, and no one saluted. And that's exactly what happened. It was a dud. Nothing happened and the coup failed. The only person that thought the coup succeeded was President Mitterrand of France who announced great support for the new regime. <laughs> <laughs> so. So we have the strangest deputies meeting of my entire experience this day. We're meeting in the Roosevelt Room instead of the Situation Room. The deputies are at the table, and there are three unusual backbenchers 
the President of the United States, the Secretary of Defense, and the National Security Advisor. Now, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> now you've forgotten. Uh, so, uh, Unless you forgot why am I, I there? I'm there because Paul Wolfowitz is on vacation. And Cheney says, there's this deputies meeting. You know, you've got to go over there. Now, be tough. Great, mine's are going to be tough. So we, we have this long session, and we come up with a press release, which is what the president has asked for. And it's a little bit of a camel, like every interagency project, product is. Uh, and it didn't quite have a, you know, it didn't sort of lay down the law, if you will, or send a clear message, I thought. So the meeting breaks up. Bob goes up back up to his office. He's in Brent's office, because Brent is, is in Kennebunkport. And I walk in, and um, it's a little unusual for an assistant secretary to walk into the National Security Advisor's office. So Brent, so Bob looks up, sort of with a little, "What are you doing here?" But I knew him from the Ford administration, so he he humored me, and uh, he said, uh, "Yeah." And I said, uh, "Bob, I don't, I, I've got some problems with the statement." And he said, "What do you mean you have problems with the statement? It's tough, and it makes it clear we condemn the coup." I said, "Yes." But Bob, if you look, the word condemn is nowhere in the press release. Bob gives me a fine look, look at it, and you know, it isn't. So Bob writes in, you know, and we condemn the coup, the coup attempt. Um, and that then goes out in the press release. And the, that sentence that Bob wrote in led the evening news on every network that night and sent the very clear message that we condemn this coup attempt that the president wanted to send. And it led a, a practical lesson to me. When staffers subsequently would come with one of these turgid prose, I'd put the paper aside and I would say, tell me what your paper is trying to say. And the person would inevitably have a very clear focus statement. And then I would always say, write that down, because it's a much better statement than what you wrote. Let's move on. Um, before turning to the Gulf War, let me just talk for a, let's talk for a, just a couple of minutes about uh, the reunification of Germany, which was a huge deal, and frankly, where the president's leadership and and the particularly the cooperation between uh, Jim Baker's chief aides at state and and Condi Rice and Bob Blackwell and company at NSC really made a big difference. So this starts, I'll start this discussion. President is on a uh, political trip to Montana. Uh, and it's September 18th, 1989. And he gives a press conference in the House of Representatives chamber in Helena, Montana. And I'm with him because I do these political trips with him, and he wanted Brent or me with him. And, <clears throat> and the president was asked a question about German reunification. And he said, well, I think it's a matter for the Germans to decide. I don't think we should view that as bad for Western interests. I think there's been a dramatic change in post-World War II Germany. And so I don't fear it. I think there is in some quarters a feeling, well, a reunified Germany would be detrimental to the peace of Europe of Western Europe in some way. I don't accept that at all. I simply don't. So I immediately left the chamber and I called Brent. I said, Brent, do we have a policy on German reunification? <laughs> he said, no, we're still working on it. I said, well, you've got one now. <laughs> and he said, what is it? I said, we're for it. <laughs> and I think he said something diplomatic like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, of all the leaders, particularly Margaret Thatcher and Mitterrand, George Bush was the only senior leader who really favored German reunification. But Bob State and NSC were very much involved in this. Would you care to offer? Well. I, I would actually just pick up on the theme that you put out, and it's what I thought was sort of an instinctive feel for the right position in foreign policy that the president have. Germans have a term called fingerspitzengefühl, fingertip feel. This president had the most incredible fingertip feel for dramatic, almost tectonic shifts in the global political environment. Now, interestingly, after the president says that, a month later, 
my predecessor as ambassador to Germany, Dick Walters, in his first public appearance, says, I think Germany's going to unify during my time as ambassador. Well, Brent hadn't fully accepted what the president said, because he, <laughs> he called Dick Walters and reamed him out and said, what the heck are you talking about? German unification, this is going to take some time. And, and uh, I think Dick probably kept along his line, given the fact that he had been the president's deputy at the CIA. He thought he was a little bit insulated on, on what he could say. Um, but I would go also to the uh, uh, three weeks before the fall of the wall. So in late October of 1989, the president gave an interview to Johnny Apple of the New York Times. And the interview was focused primarily on the initial failed attempt to get Noriega, which had happened in October of 89. But at the very end, Johnny Apple, who had spent a lot of time at the Times in Europe, said, Mr. President, by the way, I keep hearing more about this possibility of German unification. Have you given any thought to this? And he picked up on exactly the themes that you mentioned, but also said, if Germany unites within NATO, the alliance will have achieved one of its greatest goals. And really, that sort of set the tone for everything that we did after, including two plus four and so forth. Headline in the front page of the New York Times the next day was um, basically, uh, President uh, says no need to worry about German unification. By coincidence, that night, Bob Blackwell and I were having dinner with three European Union political directors, one of whom was the French political director. And at dinner, spontaneously, he said, Mr. Kimmett, has the US government begun to think about the possibility of German unification? And I just pulled out the New York Times article, gave it to him, and I said, the president has said, if Germany unites within NATO, the alliance will have achieved one of its greatest goals. And he said, well, I know that's what we've said, but what do you really mean? <laughs> Uh, a very French approach uh, to diplomacy. <laughs> and, 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 and I said, you've really got to be careful. Um, when the United States president, particularly this president, says something, he means what he says. And um, I think, again, three weeks before the wall fell, even at that point, the fall was not inevitable. Um, uh, the guidance that we got at the strategic level was really crucial. S state defense interaction, Again, we had, by the time the wall fell, had sort of nine months of working together on policy formulation, some of the early crises, including Tiananmen Square. But in fact, NATO was crucial to uh, the German unification question being answered in a manner that served our strategic interests. We had 325,000 soldiers in Europe, 275,000 of them in, in Germany at the time. Um, there had to be just exceptionally close coordination between the two departments, uh, departments at the policy level, but also our diplomats and commanders uh, in the field. And I think one of the things that, that we did really well was giving the people in the field um, the opportunity to participate in the process by taking seriously the views that we received from them we would then take them first to a, a policy coordination committee at the assistant secretary level, but, but by the time we got to the deputies level, I think there was a pretty good sense of what the critical issues were. Again, a lot of disagreements on it, but we knew we had leaders who were prepared to make those decisions uh, in the strategic context that the president had set out. I would just say on German reunification, I, I think I can probably speak for Secretary Baker and, and Brent certainly for myself on this, that perhaps one of the most extraordinary meetings any of us ever attended was the president's meeting with Gorbachev in the cabinet room. And uh, the chief of the Soviet general staff, Marshal Akramayev, was seated to his right, as I recall. And we were arrayed along our side of the table. And, and the president basically pitches Gorbachev, in essence saying, don't you believe that people ought to have the right to choose what alliance uh, they would be a member of? And, and I'm, I'm uh, abbreviating it somewhat, but, in, but Gorbachev says, yes, I do. I thought Akramayev was going to have a stroke. <laughs> and everybody on our side is saying, make him say it again, <laughs> just for the record, <laughs> so we can get it down. And, 
and the president sort of went back at him uh, and got him to say it again. And the Soviet side is just all going berserk. And, and finally, I think in the press statement afterward, the president said Gorbachev had said this, and Gorbachev did not quarrel with it. So it really, that was kind of, if you talk about a seminal moment when you knew history had been made at that very moment, that was it. Let's talk about the Gulf War. Richard, why don't you start off with the first and second NSC? Well, when the Saddam Hussein uh, went into Kuwait, this is now the beginning of August of uh, 1990. They've been building up over the course of several weeks, but until the last few days, it didn't look that it was likely to happen. We thought it was a uh, more of a way to pressure uh, Kuwait. It then happened, and we basically ended up having a, something of a, an all-night uh, video conference. By then, the technology had become widely uh, instituted around the uh, government. But the first proper NSC where we brought everybody in was in, I thought, about the least successful NSC. I had uh, I'd ever been a part of Secretary Baker was off shooting wild boar or something with, uh, <laughs> with Shevard Nadze. <laughs> Bob was hiking the hills of some part of, I don't know, Wyoming or one of those kinds, one of those places. And, but it was a crisis that came in. It, people just didn't have their footing the first meeting. And I think, the, and I remember get, coming out of the meeting, uh, I was a backbencher, and talking to Brent and saying, that was really bad. And he said, you're not kidding, or something a little bit saltier than that. <laughs> and he said, do something about it. Uh, write something. And he and the president were about to get on a plane uh, to go out to Aspen, where there was a long-standing speech on nuclear weapons. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher was going to, uh, Prime Minister Thatcher was going to be out there and all that. And so I wrote something, sent it out to the plane, which was basically, we were arguing about why we thought the United States uh, had to reverse this, that this was to use a word that's often used in government but not intended, it really was unacceptable. And we thought that needed to not just be said, but we thought it needed to be, to be meant. Uh, and when the, the president and Brent uh, came back, we then, the second, we got ready for the second NSC, and there was a, a consensus that it needed to be a very different meeting than the first one. And the president, who was extremely upset over what was going on and about what Saddam Hussein had done, wanted to speak at the meeting and make it clear from the get-go of this second NSC meeting that it was going to be U.S. policy not to, to reverse Saddam Hussein's uh, aggression. Because by this point, he had not simply gone into Kuwait. He'd absorbed it, essentially, into, into, into Iraq, the so-called, what, 19th province, I, I, I think it, it was. And Brent and Larry Eagleberger said, uh, sir, with all due respect, you ought not to do that. It was not what the president wanted to hear. They said, you ought not to do that, because once the President of the United States says, this is our policy, if it, it's going to kill the conversation. No one else is going to say, we disagree. So the President reluctantly uh, held back, and the idea was that Brent, Larry Eagleburger, and Secretary of Defense Cheney would, would each make their, their, their piece. And the, the three of them essentially did their best Churchill uh, impersonations. Uh, about how this could not allow to be. And by, so after about 20 minutes of the second NSC meeting, the, the tone had completely shifted to not whether we were going to reverse this, but, but when and how. And that was, if you will, the beginning of what grew into a Desert Storm. We then spent Saturday up at, at, at Camp David, looking for the first time at the, uh, the military options and the whole idea and against the backdrop of this was then diplomatically trying to rally uh, the world. And the president was staying up at Camp David a, an extra day. And so he was going to come back on, on the Sunday before the next NSC uh, meeting. And uh, I suddenly get a call from Brent. I hadn't been home for several days. And I get a call from Brent. And he says, I can't be there. I need you to go out to meet him. I said, OK. Uh, the problem was I was wearing jeans uh, and basically a, a T-shirt. And I, 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 it's not the way you should greet the President of the United States on the, the South Lawn of the White House. So I went around the Situation Room and I gathered clothing. Uh, <laughs> so I, if you look at the pictures, you'll see a guy with jacket sleeves up to here. Uh, but I gathered what looked to be a sufficient, suitable uh, clothing. The other thing was the President then needed to make remarks. 
So I started to sit down to type out the remarks, but I hadn't slept for 48 hours. One of the problems, by the way, of crises is people are asked to do their most important work when they've had no sleep. So I, I, I'm not a very good typist to begin with, so I was going like this. So Condi Rice, who was there at the time, who had the Russia account at the NSC, she said, oh my god, will you get out of that chair and just tell me what you want him to say? <laughs> so I, I then had the advantage of dictating uh, the briefing, the remarks, to the president. And what it basically was was a summary of all the international reactions or, and, and essentially how non-robust they were to what Saddam Hussein had come, particularly from the Middle East. So he lands at um, the South Lawn, and he motions for me to come over. And there's a, a gazillion microphones. And I hand them the piece of paper. And it, it was just a list of how, and everyone was basically temporizing. And he, we talked for a minute. And that was the moment when then, and this was uh, his doing, his words, when he, he spoke to the world. And you talk about seminal moments. This, for me, was the seminal moment uh, of the crisis, where the president on his, on his own said, this will not stand. This aggression against Kuwait will not stand. I subsequently learned uh, sec uh, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was so much surprised at that comment because uh, the president, uh, unbelievably enough, had gotten ahead of the deputies committee and, and, the, and the interagency process. <laughs> uh, we hadn't quite agreed. Uh, More like German reunification. <laughs> that, but that, uh, from that moment on, that became the, the foundational uh, policy. And essentially, what the next six months, uh, and Dick and, and, and Bob Kimmett and others played a, a, a central role in it, uh, was essentially how we were going to implement it through the phases of what were, first was Desert Shield and, and, and then was uh, Desert Storm. But, uh, and again, it was, it was one of those moments where it wasn't inevitable, I thought, or how would I put it? It's quite possible that different people, different administrations, would have reacted differently. It's quite possible a different president or a different administration might have said, look, this is bad, but we can live with it, and we'll put sanctions against uh, Saddam, and that will be the totality of it. But the idea that we would ultimately send half a million US soldiers around the world to liberate uh, this country, it may, it may look inevitable in retrospect. It sure as hell didn't look inevitable at the time, particularly if you recall, all the dire predictions of the tens of thousands of Americans uh, who were going to die in the process, uh, the lack of congressional support, uh, Boyden and others will know, and Johnson, the, the vote barely passed the, uh, the, the, the Senate. And if there, to me, it was the, it was the most uh, salient example of how uh, people make a difference. It could have been a very, very different policy had different people beginning with uh, the 41st president, been in power at the time. Well, it was an extraordinary act of leadership. Most people forget that when the president, after the president made that statement, uh, within a few days, public support for what he was doing was about 15%. 99% in February, 15% in October, November. One of my favorite uh, experiences in that, in that meeting uh, in, during that pre-war period was the president kept pushing the Pentagon to get an offensive place, a force in place. Uh, we had 200 and some thousand troops in Saudi Arabia, so Saudi Arabia was well defended and clearly Saddam couldn't go any further, but the president wanted to throw Saddam out of Kuwait and he kept asking for the offensive plan and finally, uh, the de Defense Department grudgingly uh, agreed to present him with the options. Now, my experience has been that any time the president wants to use military force, the Pentagon generally comes up with options that invariably look like D-Day <laughs> in the hope of deterring the president from the use of military right. force. <laughs> so the briefer comes in, and it's, uh, it's General Schwarzkopf's deputy, and he said, first we want to move the Seventh Corps out of uh, Germany and send it to Saudi Arabia. So these are the two heaviest divisions in the American Army. Everything's been painted green since 1945. <laughs> They've got bricks and mortar barracks and everything else. So moving these two divisions is a huge logistical as well as political and historical movement. Second, we'll need six aircraft carrier battle groups. <laughs> 
okay? And this was a week before the midterm elections, and they say, oh, and you've got to activate the National Guard and the Reserve. <laughs> to the day I die, I'll never forget, the president stood up, looked at Dick Cheney, and said, you've got it. Let me know if you need more, and walked out of the room. <laughs> Bob, why don't you and Richard say a few words. One of the things that I think is unique in my career was that we actually had a written set of war aims that the president signed off on for this war. Maybe you all could talk about the options that we looked at and what we decided to include and what we didn't. Well, to some degree, that goes back to what happened in that long deputies committee um, on the night that Saddam invaded uh, Kuwait because out of that deputies committee came um, you know, a war powers notification to the Congress. We did a complete economic sanctions and asset freeze. And there, very importantly, we got resolution 660 at the United Nations that called for unconditional withdrawal. <clears throat> and interestingly, uh, among <clears throat> those who voted for it were the Chinese, the Soviets, um, and even the Cubans, uh, the Cubans thinking probably not a good idea to encourage big countries to the north to invade small countries to the <laughs> south. Um, so it was, you know, the first 15-0 vote ever um, in uh, the United uh, Nations, and that really so in the Security Council that really sort of set the tone. And then once the president made the strategic declaration that you discussed, um, we in what was called the small group with really Richard having the pen, began to look at a range of issues, but the key was uh, the issue of war aims. Uh, coming off that UN resolution with the instruction that the uh, president had given us, um, I'll let Richard talk to it because, again, he did most of the writing. All I would say is that we um, looked very closely at aims um, that would apply for the coalition more broadly rather than simply the United States. So holding the coalition together, both militarily and diplomatically, was a very important part of it. And what we had as the base for the coalition effort was that unconditional withdrawal. That was tested later by people who were suggesting that there's some little sweeteners we could give to Saddam that maybe he'd be nice enough to leave. And we kept saying, what don't you understand about unconditional? So we knew we had that as the basis, but that didn't answer all the questions, and particularly it didn't answer the questions uh, of what happens when you have gotten him out of Kuwait, uh, when you are in uh, Iraq, when you really control a good part of the southern part of that country. And uh, I think that we looked much closer at the option of going to Baghdad than people realize. And um, it, it was both a military intelligence, but also a, a real political question, because we had support for the ejection, but not support for going further, taking over uh, that country. Um, and I remember personally being very glad that we came out where we did, that is, deciding that we weren't going to go to Baghdad, because Bob had decided that if we did, I was going to be the first high commissioner uh, in Baghdad, uh, an honor that, uh, that I was uh, more than happy to decline. But again, I think it came out of the fact that once we had that UN foundation laid, and then of course the subsequent resolutions from 660 to the use of force resolution was, was 678, we knew we had a basis to hold together uh, the most complex multinational coalition but as we went further into looking at the war aims, we saw that while the military prowess was there to keep going, it was going to rip asunder that coalition that would have effects not just for the prosecution of the war, but for the potential stability of the region thereafter. Richard? Yep. Bob's exactly right. Uh, there were various reasons that we, we, we we didn't do more. The one area I think we got it wrong before I talk about where we got it right is we thought 
we probably did not need to go on much in order to see Saddam Hussein fall. And we, we, many of us assumed that he would be unable to survive this second military debacle, the first being the war with uh, Iran. And we, we got that wrong. We didn't, we didn't count on, in some ways, the twin rebellion starting, which then gave him a new lease on life. And I, I would just simply say, and it's something I used to talk to my students about, it's the importance of always uh, looking very, very carefully at your assumptions. Because uh, assumptions can, can, can get you, can get you in, in trouble. That said, even if we had assumed differently, uh, I don't think we necessarily would or should have, have acted differently. We were very wary of the, the difficulties of taking ownership of, uh, of Iraq. Uh, you know, I think history has demonstrated you know, some, of the, some of the wisdom uh, uh, of that uh, position. We were very concerned also that we had something of a deal, and Bob was getting at this, with the international community. And the idea was that we would, we would if you will, reinforce the notion of, of the sanctity of borders, that force should not be used to create geopolitical facts. And but we were not going to use this for larger purposes. Indeed, we wanted in the Middle East, among other things, to launch a peace process, which we did. Uh, people forget that one of the byproducts of the, of the Gulf War was the first time, months later, in, in October of 91, that Israel and all the Arab countries met face to face to discuss peace. And that happened in Madrid in the final uh, days of October of, of 91. So there was a, an understanding of what we wanted to accomplish there. We wanted to set the message that, this was, uh, that the post-Cold War world could not become a Hobbesian world, that it was important to, to show the limits to which uh, military force could be, be used by, by, by an aggressive uh, power. And I think that was done very well. Imagine how history might have unfolded quite differently if the opening event of the post-Cold War era had been one in which aggression had been allowed to, had been allowed to, to stand. There's also, I think, an awareness domestically of the, the thinness of, of the degree of uh, support. As I said, the, the vote in the, in the Senate was a close-run thing. So it, it's something that goes back to where we began the conversation. There was a sense of, of, of strategic purpose, but also to some extent the importance of limits. And I think that's part of what, what makes a, a great power great. So there was, there was an awareness. So while we scrubbed all the, uh, all the options about how far to go, the, uh, there, there was, at the end of the day, a consensus amongst the interagency that, that, that if you will not go into Baghdad, not changing your war aims. The parallel I wrote, I remember the, writing the memo and talking to Brent and the president about it was Korea. And if you recall what happened in Korea after the landing at Incheon, uh, Marshall wanted to go north of the 38th parallel, got permission from Truman, and they went north of the 38th parallel. And the rest, as they say, is history. And more, as many Americans died in that phase of the Korean War as died otherwise. And we were very nervous and uneasy. And in the end, I think wisely, the president decided not to expand our war aim strategically in the flush of tactical uh, victory. And that, to me, was as important as, uh, as any other decision. Yeah, i say one other thing, just in, actually two other things in terms of the history where I think is, is worth pointing out on, on the Gulf War. One is what would have happened had the Gulf War vote gone the other way in the Senate. I actually think uh, we would have done it anyway. Boyden and others were, were intimately involved. But we made it very clear in the wording of the resolution that was sent to the uh, Congress that we were not asking for their, uh, their authority. We were asking for their approval of what the president and the national security team wanted to do. The idea was we had all the authority. We, you know, the, the, thank you very much in Article 51 in the UN resolutions and so forth. So, there, so the, uh, the authority from Congress was not required. If they wanted to approve it, so much the better. But it was, uh, but it was not required. The other was perhaps, uh, coming back to Mrs. Thatcher, the, the line, don't go wobbly is often used in the idea that early on in the crisis, she needed to talk to the president to get him to do the right thing. Not so. And as John Meacham will show when he writes the book, as he will, be, uh, he will get the history right here, I am I, 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 I'm sure. That came up around several weeks later. And what it was was when Secretary Baker basically said, give us another couple of days. We're going to get the entire international community, and Bob played a key, key role in this, in getting the international community on board, the use of force, to, to, to enforce the sanctions that had been put in place. And Mrs. Thatcher didn't want to wait at the time. 
Well, well the specifics were we had, a, we had an Iraqi ship right. coming out of the quarantined area. And, and the question was whether to stop that ship or sink it. And, and there was a huge debate inside the administration. And, and my recollection is that Brent and I and Larry Eagleburger and Secretary Cheney thought we should stop it and sink it or sink it. And Secretary Baker was arguing, no, let it go because I'm so close to having the Soviets on board with a use of force declaration, uh, resolution. And the president went with Jim and it was exactly the right thing to have done. And, but that was the context in which Margaret Thatcher said, don't go wobbly. She was on Eagle Burgers and Brents and my side. <laughs> the impatient side. <laughs> the impatient side. I would just say that the thing that's amazing about the war aims is how explicit they were and how we stuck to them. We really, there were three that were discussed of consequence and that were in that paper. The first was ejecting Saddam from Kuwait. No brainer. Second, destruction of the Republican Guard as an offensive weapon of the Iraqis. No problem. We debated whether to go to Baghdad for probably two weeks. And it was the hard one. And, and finally came out the way, the way uh, Bob and Richard have, have described it. I will add this postscript. Um, during the Iraq study group, Jim Baker and I once had a conversation and we talked about how from 1991 or 1993, until 2003, when he or I were giving a speech, we would always get a hostile question about why didn't you guys go on to Baghdad? And after March of 2003, for some reason, we never got that question again. <laughs> I, would, I would just add a little bit more. Um, the um, UN Security Council had effectively been a feckless operation during the Cold War because of the Soviet veto, but it became a very effective organization, um, uh, and in, indeed Saddam sort of triggered the effectiveness with his invasion. Um, there is a rotating chair of the Security Council each month, and by coincidence, the Soviets were in the chair in September of 1990. And we had been building a series of resolutions. Uh, first was the unconditional withdrawal. Then we actually had um, economic sanctions on a global basis. And then as Bob said, the next big one was to get the authorization to use force to enforce the sanctions. Because we thought if we could get that, it would set us up for the ultimate use of force resolution later. And we had this planned out so well that we wanted to do the use of force to enforce the sanctions while the Soviets were in the chair. So Shevardnadze could basically be the big guy in this particular important session of the Security Council. By the way, we were in the chair in November when the ultimate use of force resolution came up. And we were um, coordinating as we always did at that time. We'd sort of make our decision, we'd get right with the Brits, then we would talk to the French, and then we'd reach out to the Soviets and the Chinese. And we were in the process of doing that on the day that Mrs. Thatcher and the President flew back from Aspen. And they flew in, went out to the Rose Garden, and made some joint statements. And she was supposed to leave right from there to go to Andrews and go home, and the heavens just broke, just started to pour. So everybody comes back into the Oval Office. Now, the President and Mrs. Thatcher have been on a plane for several hours. They're sort of talked out, and the President looks at me and said, Bob, what's up at the UN? I said, well, Mr. President, here is where we are on that use of force resolution and force sanctions. Mrs. Thatcher said, let me see that young man. She grabs it, she looks at it, absolutely unacceptable, absolutely. And I said, well, uh, Madam Prime Minister, and, and meanwhile, I'm not getting a lot of support from the President or Jim Baker on this. You know, they, they started checking to see what was coming next. And I said, well, what we're trying to do on all of these is to get the basic authority we need, but to keep getting not only the support in the Permanent Five, but more broadly, 
we think we've threaded that needle and we've worked very closely with, with your government. And I just got off a conversation with Michael Havers, your attorney general. Oh, Michael would never agree with this. Absolutely not. I thought, OK. Well, it kept raining. And the president said, I'm sorry, I've got to get on to my next meeting. So Mrs. Thatcher and I and Richard and a few others go into the Roosevelt Room. Really? And she continued to beat us about the head and shoulders on the unacceptability of this. Fortunately, when uh, she got home and checked with her attorney general and, and others, she found that we had done a pretty good job of coordinating it. Bob told me that uh, she had passed the message that uh, uh, tell that young Mr. Kim that he's won this one, but I'm watching him very closely. <laughs> <laughs> And at, at least she didn't refer to you as Tweedledum and Tweedledee. <laughs> she did Eagleburger and me. <laughs> I think we've run out of time. We, we were supposed to have a Q&A session, but uh, uh, I, think that the, I think the only fair thing in terms of the names we have evoked uh, repeatedly here is to allow uh, for two questions from the audience and, and I'll call on uh, former Secretary of State Jim Baker to ask the first one, and Brent to ask the second. Steve, can I have this water? Thanks. <laughs> or, or you can say what you were going to say when we talked about this earlier. <laughs> Well, rather than ask a question, let me make a comment about this performance up there. Brent, <laughs> Brent, Brent and I are sitting here in the front row, and we've agreed that they've got about 40% of it right. <laughs> That's not true. That was a tremendous panel discussion. I know we all enjoyed it. Um, you know, one point that was made that I think is really significant is that <clears throat> The way foreign policy was conducted in this administration was the exception to the rule. You go back, all the way back, or you go forward after we left, you will not find an administration that had a, a more expert or satisfactory policy process than this administration. And that's due entirely to the leadership of the 41st President of the United States who understood foreign policy. Well, well, he'd, he'd been involved in foreign policy. He knew how foreign policy was supposed to work, and he made sure that it did work that way. And as someone on the panel has pointed out, he selected people, all of whom had worked together in prior iterations. Brent, Colin Powell, Dick Cheney, myself, and of course the president had been CIA director. So, and, and we'd practically all done something in the Ford administration. So it was, uh, it was a very fortunate circumstance, and I think it worked very well uh, for the United States. Let me just say one other thing, and I'll give the, the mic to Brent. George Bush was not only a great leader. He was a tremendous boss. I can testify to that because I worked for him for a long, long time. He was loyalty up and loyalty down. And any time I screwed up, which I did often, he, was, he had my back. Never, never, never. And you cannot succeed as a Secretary of State unless you have a seamless relationship with your president. I was fortunate enough to have that as a consequence of having played tennis competitively with him for so many years <laughs> and having had the good fortune of helping him when he was campaigning, so nobody was going to get between me and my president politically, and having the good fortune as well that he's the godfather of my daughter. What a wonderful president. Well, I don't have much to add to this uh, spectacular uh, uh, moment, uh, other than to say they've got about 45% of it right. Uh, but let me just add to what Jim has said about uh, President Bush. Uh, he was 
uniquely qualified to be president, and he used that qualification brilliantly. You've heard these five great people. Uh, that's replicated throughout his administration. But think what he did. He was a member of Congress. He ran the Republican Party. He was our ambassador to the United Nations, so he had a unique view how the rest of the world looked at the world and at the United States. Then he went to China when it was a completely separate world. We had had no contact with him for two decades. Then he came back and he was director of the CIA in charge of understanding the world. Then he was vice president for eight years and watched the operation of the system and what worked and what didn't. And he put in a seamless system, as seamless as this government can ever get. And it worked. And it was seamless for two reasons. For the people he picked, he knew who he wanted to pick because he had worked with most of them before and he had watched what worked and what didn't in the process. And he also understood the process like no one else had. Uh, and it was an honor, a privilege, and a joy to work under him and implement his thoughts. And this country is unbelievably fortunate to have had George Herbert Walker Bush as its president.